Good morning, everybody. Good morning. We are over the resurrection, and we're on back into Mark chapter 8. So if you guys would pray with me. Our Father and our God, we thank you for the opportunity to come and to look into your word, and it's always so nourishing to our soul. We thank you that we can gather with those of like mind, those who have uh, met you and know you. I thank you that you have blessed our fellowship in this place, that you've provided for our needs, and Lord, that you have promised to meet with us. I pray, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts, that you'd help us to learn from Jesus, that we might know more of you, that we might be more yielding to your spirit, that we might more resemble your son, Jesus Christ. So Lord, help us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're back in Mark chapter 8, and the, the first section is all about bread. So we've just had communion, so that's rather good. And you, the band that you probably don't recognize is the band called Bread. So is this Baby I'm a Walkie? Yeah, that one. So it's all about bread. And Jesus says in John chapter 6, verses 47 to 50, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. So Jesus was comparing himself to the manna in the wilderness and that Jesus is a better selection off the menu than the one that they had in the Old Testament. Uh, just so that you, I know Johnny read it, but I read it a second time. We didn't even plan that, it just happened. So last time we were in the book of Mark, we were in chapter seven. There was a whole bunch going on just to refresh our memories. The Pharisees were criticizing Jesus because the disciples were eating without their hands being washed ceremonially. It's not that they had dirty hands, but they didn't wash in the way the Pharisees thought they should wash. Very, very involved procedure. And they were wondering why they didn't keep the tradition of the elders, but ate with unwashed hands. It's not that Jesus was against hygiene. It's that he didn't want to get obsessed with things that were extra biblical, that God did not give as an order. And suddenly man puts things on par. That's what a lot of religions do, don't they? They take the word of God and they add things on top of it so that, uh, I, I don't know why they do that. I really don't understand. I, I try never to do anything unless it comes from the text. If it's not in the text, well, then you're going to have a hard time convincing me I need to do it. Like washing my hands in a, in a certain way with a certain, you know, you're going to have a really hard time convincing me it's God's will, you know, that cleanliness is next to godliness. He says, you guys do a lot of things like that. And he says, you have folks who voluntarily give their money to you into the synagogue. And they called it Corban, which is giving to the, the local uh, assembly all of your money when you die. And he goes, well, that's, that's, that's really great. Um, you, you tell people that they can do that and then they don't have anything to take care of their aged parents. And he goes, you guys take these traditions. And he goes, there's lots of things that you do like that. You take tradition and put it up here and you take God's commands like honor your father and mother and you completely wash them out. You shouldn't do that. So Jesus was big on straightening out their traditional minds. We saw a woman who was a, a Syrophoenician who came up to Jesus and was begging him to heal her daughter because her daughter had an unclean spirit. And she kept she kept haranguing on him. And finally, he says, it's not appropriate that I give the children's bread to the little dogs. And he was referring to her and her daughter as being little dogs. And instead of becoming offended, she says, yes, Lord, but even the little dogs will eat the scraps from the master's table. And so this humility, this, this woman showed as she was asking Jesus to move on her behalf, move Jesus to compassion. And he says, you got it. And she returns home and her daughter's fine. The, the, the evil spirits have left her. And so Jesus then does give her scraps from the table. And as far as she was concerned, she was asking for a little thing. You and I might think that's a huge thing. 
But for Jesus, she understood it would be a small thing, and she wasn't asking too much of him. And then we have a man who comes up who's deaf and mute, so he can't hear and he can't speak. And so Jesus takes him aside, away from the crowds, because he never does something for a crowd. Uh, if Jesus were here going to do a miracle, it wouldn't be here on stage. It would be probably back there where no one else would see. Because it's always when Jesus does a miracle, it's a personal thing between him and the person he's doing a miracle for. Isn't it like that with you? When he came to me, it was a personal thing between me and him, where he did business with my soul and I got saved. And it's the same. So he takes him aside and he, he touches his tongue and he touches his ears and he spits on the ground, I believe, and he heals this guy. And suddenly he can see and uh, he can hear and he can speak, which is an amazing thing. And so Jesus heals this man in some very unorthodox ways. And we're going to see another one next week. You can read on ahead and be dismayed like me. <laughs> and so he heals, he heals this deaf mute and, and he's healed. So as we're going through this life of Jesus, he's got his disciples in tow and he's in the middle of his ministry going around the Galilean area. There, there's what's called a, the Jesus Triangle up on the northern section of the Sea of Galilee. And basically he's bouncing around from side to side uh, up in the northern section. So we're going to keep an eye on that. This week we're in chapter eight, which is all about bread, my favorite food group <laughs> of which I don't eat except for that little piece this morning. Beginning in verse 1 to chapter 8, In those days, the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now continued with me for three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their houses, they will faint on the way, for some of them have come from far away. This seems strangely familiar, doesn't it? It's almost word for word the feeding of the 5,000. But it's not. This is the feeding of the 4,000. But there are some distinctive differences between the two, and there are some scholars that say, ah, it's the same story, just they counted different. No. It's in a completely different area, completely different audience, and there are different things about it. And as we go through, I'll point those out to you. First thing, Jesus says... We got a problem here. We have a whole bunch of people that are following and they've been with us for three days and they're all hungry. Gee, what should we do, guys? Do you see Jesus is challenging his disciples to come up and to show some faith and say, well, Jesus, you remember when you pulled that rabbit out of your hat before? When you took all that bread from that little boy's lunch? These five loaves, they're they basically, you know, like little rolls and, and some fish and fed the 5,000. Like you would think one of these guys is on top of it. He's got the gift of leadership or he's got a gifted memory and he can remember two chapters back to chapter six and remember that Jesus fed this incredible multitude. Now, that multitude was Jewish. This multitude is largely Gentile. And he's... He's got all these Gentiles around him. He says, they're hungry, and I have compassion on them. Jesus with his compassion again. Uh, you, you think that God is an unfeeling person or an unfeeling personality that doesn't feel the things that we feel, and yet God came into a human body and experienced all the same emotions and all the, you know, everything that we experience, and he poured himself into being a humble human but not human alone. He was God and human and experienced everything that we did and yet without sin, showing us how to be done. And he has compassion. He feels bad for these people. These people are here to learn and they're following Jesus three days in a wilderness to learn. You know, we, we find it hard if we don't find a parking space. We get a little ornery and cranky. These guys were three days in a wilderness area listening to Jesus teach. And he says, I feel bad for them. They, they need some food. And so Jesus presents this to his disciples. He didn't tell the people, he told his disciples, the ones who were in charge, the ones who were supposed to be in leadership here. And I think he's saying, well, listen, don't tell me to send them away again. You guys solve this. 
Because if you remember before, the disciples came up and said, Jesus, there's all these people. Send them away. Because they were looking for a vacation, if you remember. They were looking to get away and kind of have a a conversation with Jesus. And they didn't get a chance to do that because ministry was pressed upon them. And so they stood up and did what needed to be done. But they wanted the people to go away. Imagine that. Imagine that being the goal of the church is to have people stay away. You know, I wish you would all just stay away. I'd have much less to do. And yet that can be our mentality sometimes about people because people carry baggage. Not just at the airport. I mean, people carry baggage. There's, are you guys aware of this? I get no amen, no no consolation whatsoever. (laughs) Yes, pastor, we understand. No, not, not even that. People are problems. Listen, my car doesn't start. I can get that fixed. But people, they're a little harder. (laughs) But I praise God for Jesus' compassion. And he puts it to his disciples. He's always training his disciples just like he's always training us. And so he puts them in a situation. He goes, hey, listen, I feel bad for these people. They've been around here for three days. and They've got nothing to eat. If I send them home, they're going to faint on the way. And Jesus waits for a response. In verse 4, and then his his disciples answered him, how can anyone satisfy these people with bread here in the wilderness? Really? I mean, really. This is almost exactly the same scenario as they had two chapters ago, right? You would think somebody in the pack of 12 would say, hey, I got an idea. Let's... Let's frisk all the little boys and see if they got a lunch. (laughs) You know, nothing. Nothing. Like, we can't do it. There's no way. Now, I don't know if you guys ever feel that way. There's no way. There's no way God can help us out here. There's no way that I can get out of this situation. It's so hard. There's no way God will do it. And he can't do it. Or can he? Of course he can. But the problem is they didn't remember a thing. It's like their brain was like a a blank slate. What's going on here? Can you relate? Have you ever been in a place where you thought you would never get out? There's no rescue. There's no provision. There's no way. And God made a way. Why don't we remember that the next hard time that comes around? Because we, we have a memory like a goldfish. It's a three-second memory, sometimes. So what are we going to do? Oh, no. Well, Jesus looks to his followers for faith, and he finds forgetful followers fretting from fatigue and feelings of fear and foodlessness. Now you know what I stay up late nights doing. But it's exactly right. Jesus looks to his followers for faith, and he finds forgetful followers fretting from fatigue and feelings of fear for foodlessness. What are we going to do? And I can see Jesus going. (laughs) Right? Exasperation. What am I going to do with you guys? I... But you know what? Jesus is on mission, and what he's doing is training the disciples. And he already knows what's inside of a man. It says he didn't entrust himself to a man because he knew it was inside of a man. And so Jesus anticipated this. And so he tests them again to see if they'll be full of faith in this foodlessness. They had no expectancy, no recognition of past faithfulness, In similar circumstances, no faith for victories won in the past, much like us. You know, God brings us through difficult things, and we tend to forget them and then just get tied up into our own little lives. And then something comes where there's a bump in the road, and we go, (gasps) and we're completely, totally devastated. How does that happen? That's why a lot of scholars believe this is just a retelling of the 5,000, because how could they be so thick? But you get this, right? Okay. And then his disciple answered him, how can one satisfy these people with bread in the wilderness? 
Have you ever wondered why you continue going through the same trials over and over again? Because it's never a pass or fail. It's a pass or do-over. And it's always a pass or do-over until we get it right. And so that encourages me to get it right because I don't want to do over those things, hard things, difficulties, right? In Matthew 6, 25 to 26, Jesus tells us the attitude of our hearts, what it should be. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life or what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And that's really what it comes down to, that we don't think God cares, that he has compassion, that he loves us more than a sparrow. That's little faith right there. And verse 31 says, therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink or what shall we wear? We're not to worry about those things because if we entrust ourselves to God, who's our provider and protector, we shouldn't be worrying about that, right? But we get our eyes on ourselves and we get our eyes on our own little world and we think it's all on, it's all on us. Where's God in that equation? Listen, I know it's quiet in here because you guys are relating to me. And I'm just like that. The same problems we face are often the training that we need to remember that Jesus is the solution. And it's interesting, Jesus is the one who presented the problem because Jesus wants to be the solution. You understand some of the stuff that you go through? Jesus brings, it has his signature on it. And he sends it down the line and suddenly it ends in your lap. Do you understand that he does that so that you might learn So the reason I have hard times very often is because I haven't learned my, I haven't gotten that passing grade yet. And so we see things like this, like it's a gigantic, complicated math problem. And Jesus sees it simple. Is anybody going to realize that I can handle this and that maybe you can't? And that's the bottom line, isn't it? It's trusting in him for all those things. And he tells us to do that. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, because my yoke is easy and my burden is light, and you will find rest for your weary souls. If you're tired of pulling the thing, you know, pulling the plow by yourself, it's because you weren't designed to. And then Jesus asked them, how many loaves do you have? It's almost word for word, like the 5,000. And they said... Seven. So they got more than they did last time. And so he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground. This time the disciples didn't do it. Jesus did. But you notice he asked them for bread this time. They didn't shake down some little boy. He expected them to step up. How many loaves do you have? And he broke them. He took the seven loaves and he gave thanks. Always giving thanks. Thanks. You want to give thanks to God? You want God to do a miracle? He better get the glory, right? He broke them and he gave them to his disciples and set before them. And they set them before the multitude. (coughs) And then he says, they also had a few small fish. Interesting. Where'd they come from? Jesus said, what are we going to do? I don't know. How many loaves do you got? We got seven. Okay. Well, let's, let's work with that. And so in the middle of praying for that and passing that out and Jesus is doing the miracle, somebody pulls out a hidden lunch. (laughs) We got some fish too, Lord, while you're at it. It's almost like they needed (laughs) to know that Jesus was going to be able to do this again before they pulled out their portion. Isn't that curious? Aren't you and I like that? Like, Lord, I got to know I can trust you with this. And, you know, like when I when because everybody wants to be on a winning team, right? Nobody wants to pick a losing team. If you're into sports, you'll know this, especially if you put money on it, which I don't recommend. But Jesus then is blessing the fish as well, which has been this hidden uh, find all of a sudden at the end. And Jesus then prays and presumably passes that out as well. 
And so some things. It always starts with what you have to contribute. So if you're trying to solve a problem, it's always good to know what your resources are, right? It's always good to know what kind of tools you have or what sort of people that you might have that can help you with this issue. And putting that together, as, as any kind of a good leader will do, you want to know what your resources are. What kind of people do we have in place? What are our tools? What are our materials? And when you get all that down, you have an idea how it's going to be taken care of. And it's interesting, Jesus doesn't just create bread from nothing. He creates bread from what they already have. And he asks us to bring what we have. Bring what you have. What do you have? I guarantee you every single one of you in this room is gifted by God in some way. Something you do better than I do. That's put there by God. He wants it back, by the way. He wants you to put it in his hands so he can use it. Because if we just run with it or hide it up our sleeve, then nobody's going to have fish. And we bring it to Jesus because a little in the hands of Jesus is much. And we see that as he's praying over them and feeding them. At what point do you think they had a clue? Hey, he's doing it again. He's, he's doing it again. Look, he keeps breaking it and breaking it and breaking it and breaking it. And everybody's getting fed. And he, look, he's still breaking the bread. Oh, my goodness. Look at it. He's doing it. Hey, I found some fish. <laughs> When did you think they got a clue? I don't know. When do you and I wake up? When God is actually doing something. You know, we're challenged with something. And then he begins to work. And it's like, he's doing it again. Man, he's faithful. He's faithful and you can trust him. And suddenly there's fish that appear. I love that because sometimes that's what we do, right? We kind of hold back. Say, well, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to give my fish away. Yeah, but when you give it away, it comes back to you, doesn't it? Amen. When you give it away, it comes back to you. And so having blessed them, he set that also before them. And they ate and were filled, by the way, the word is glutted. It means that they were full, like, you know, push back from the table, I'm done. And they took up seven large baskets of leftover fragments. By the way, these baskets are large. Uh, the King James uses the word hamper. These aren't small hand baskets. These are large baskets. Uh, like one they took the Apostle Paul and sent them down over a wall in. It's a hamper. Seven of them. Full of bread. I told you it was all about bread. I'm getting hungry. And so they ate and they were filled and they took up seven large baskets of leftover fragments. Now, those who had eaten were about 4,000. And of course, you know how they count. They count the men and then the women and the children are just kind of counted as part of those families. So that's how they counted. And so there's all of this bread from seven loaves of bread that they split that Jesus, but in his hands, was able to multiply. So it's a miracle just like the 5,000. <laughs> In Luke 6, 38, Jesus teaches us, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be poured into your bosom or into your lap. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Jesus sets down this principle in the degree in which you're willing to share and give things away. God is going to give to you. So if I'm going to be stingy, it's to my own hurt. <laughs> if I'm going to be beneficent, then it will be to my blessing. Because, see, God's looking for people he can trust. He's not going to bless you with things if you're going to be stingy about it. But if you're willing to share and you become a conduit of his provision, the Lord will bless you with lots. And then suddenly you can't give it out fast enough. You guys find that to be true? Yes. I have certainly found it to be true. So some of the things about the feeding of the 5,000 and the 4,000. The feeding of the 5,000 in Mark 6 is just like Mark 8, except with these differences. There was only one day Jesus was feeding, and it was three days for the 4,000. They were mostly Jews in Mark chapter 6, and they're mostly Gentiles in chapter 8. The first one was in Bethsaida 
on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. This one is in the Decapolis area on the southern shore of the Sea of Galilee, largely Gentile area. There were five loaves and two fish. The other one was seven loaves and a few small fish. They didn't even tell you how many, this one. There were 12 small baskets that they got back the first time, and the second time they got seven large baskets back. So these are very different events in different locations at different times. It's not the same thing being told twice. So if some sophisticated person tells you, oh, it's the same story, it's just like, yeah, okay, sure. <laughs> I'm going to sell you a story about uh, George Washington. And so after feeding the 4,000, he sends them away, immediately gets into a boat with his disciples, and came to the region of Dalmun Dalmunatha. Dalmunatha, I've got a map here. It's uh, where that little red pen is, in case you're looking for directions. <laughs> it's on that side of the, uh, of the harp. Uh, that, that's the Sea of Galilee, which is a big giant lake. It, they just called it the Sea of Galilee. And so you get to see where they're bouncing around. The Decapolis is on the opposite side of the, of the water. And he immediately takes off. If you remember, in the feeding of the 5,000, they wanted to make him king forcibly, and they wanted to have a riot yep. and rush into Jerusalem and proclaim him to be king. And Jesus then sent the disciples away in a boat, and he says, guys, you got to go. Hey, I'll catch up with you. <laughs> And he sends him out into the sea, and he goes up onto the mountain. He disperses the crowd, as many as would leave, and then he goes up on the mountain to pray. And we know that that was the event of Jesus seeing them in the middle of the, in the, middle of the water of the Sea of Galilee, and he came down and walked on water. And, you know, we went through that in chapter 6. So Jesus is making a very quick departure after feeding these people. Why? Because the first time he did this, they wanted to forcibly make him king and turn him into a vending machine, essentially. Yes, make bread for us all the time, Jesus. That'd be great. We're going to proclaim you king and we'll, we'll eat like kings. Well, Jesus didn't want that. And so his quick departure is advisable because of previous events. He doesn't want the disciples to get stumbled into the mentality of trying to take power because that is never Jesus's intention. And so they jump in the boat and say, see you, bye. We're out of here. <laughs> and then the Pharisees came out and began to dispute with him. Seeing, fr seeing from him a sign from heaven, testing him. Uh, the word for testing could also be read tempting him. And he, si he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, why does this generation seek a sign? Assuredly, I say to you, no sign shall be given this generation. Mark gives us the abbreviated version of what Jesus continues to say. He says, if you look into the sky, you can tell if, you know, you can tell what's going to happen with the weather. If you've got a south wind, you know it's going to be hot. And Jesus goes into a big explanation. But he says here in Matthew, the, the longer quote is, a wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign shall be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them and departed. Jesus explains later on a little bit longer and says, Jonah, as he was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so the son of man will be in the belly of the earth. So Jesus says, my sign to you will be my resurrection. But it's not going to come when you snap your fingers and tell me, hey, make a sign in heaven, in the sky, you know, like write my name in clouds or something. Actually, what I think they're referring to is something we find back in 1 Kings, when Elijah called down fire from heaven. He called down fire from heaven when he had this big, uh, the, the big, the, the throw in Manila with, the, uh, with all of the, the idol worshipers of Baal. And God showed up in a big way and brought fire from heaven to consume a sacrifice. And that was a big deal. So perhaps... They're trying to get him to do something like Elijah did, which was fantastic and showy. And Jesus says, this is a wicked and adulterous generation. No sign is going to be given to it except the sign of Jonah, which is his resurrection. You see, we get it wrong when we think Jesus is our vending machine. When we think God is obligated to be our servant. It's backwards. We are his servants. 
We're his creation, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he planned in advance that we should walk in. We're his creation. We should say, Lord, you say, you say jump, I'm going to say how high. Not, I demand a sign. You know, Lord, if, if, you, want, if you want to do this, I want you to, you know, shake the earth <laughs> at 1024 <laughs> in New Jersey. <laughs> Because that would be ridiculous. Nobody's going to have a 4.5 Richter scale earthquake. Sorry, I, my mind drifts. So <laughs> seeking a sign is a real problem. It's like you won't step out in faith to do those things you already know to do, that the scripture instructs us to do, that Jesus time and time again has sh shown himself to be faithful to do. We won't believe that. We need a special personal sign from God for him to alter the, you know, the earth. Do you see the arrogance in that? So the Pharisees come up and they're demanding Jesus to prove who he is, like he didn't do enough miracles, right? Like healing, raising the dead, three people he rose from the dead besides himself. Like healing people who were blind, born from birth, people who were lame, people with leprosy, people coming out with all sorts of issues, evil spirits casting them out. And they're like... Jesus, we'd like to prescribe for you and put on the menu a particular sign that we would like to see to prove that you're who you are. And if Jesus were from Jersey, he'd say, I don't play that. <laughs> and he didn't. And the amazing thing is, they get in the boat and leave. <coughs> Jesus gets in the boat and leaves. He gets to the other side, and the Pharisees step up with their big, you know, presentation and Jesus said, you know what? You're an evil and adulterous generation. You seek a sign, you're not going to get it. It's not going to happen. Be careful when you go to God with that sort of attitude because then you follow like, like they did. I don't ever want to do that. Miracles are not convincing evidence to a hardened heart. They are designed to communicate his love. We see that in the feeding of the 4,000. That was designed because he had compassion. That's why he did the miracle. He didn't do it to be sh a show off. He didn't do it for any kind of a showy thing. In fact, the previous guy he healed, he took out and took away from the crowds. Jesus isn't doing this for the flash. He's doing this for compassion and for love. And for these Pharisees to turn it into something like that is an atrocity. We need to be careful we don't do that. Lord, I'm not going to move unless you show me a sign from heaven, and it's got to be big, you know. It, it can't just be a coincidence in some, some way. Maybe two or three of them in a row, maybe I'll be convinced. No, miracles don't convince people. Miracles don't give faith to a hardened heart. A hardened heart will never change until you're willing to release it and let it go. Pray that God keeps our hearts. And he left them, getting into the boat again, and he departed to the other side. They're doing a lot of traveling. Now, the disciples had forgotten to take bread, and they did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. You're darn right, that's not a problem. But it's a problem for them. Because they were like, okay, let's set up camp, you know, and they go to set up, and the Pharisees conflict with Jesus, and he goes, you know what? You guys are way off. I'm out. Boys, let's go. They pack the boat and they leave. And they're like, I wasn't able to go shopping. I didn't even hit the mall. <laughs> and so they get in the boat and they're on their way over because they, they made a quick exit. And so Jesus waves goodbye to them and he's on his way. And Jesus is a gentleman. He'll never stay where he's not welcome. I want you to remember that. Jesus is a gentleman. And he'll never stay where he's not welcome. The question is, is my heart a welcome place for him? Or is my heart hard where I require for him to be my servant as opposed to being his? It's about faith. Jesus left because they had no faith whatsoever. In Mark 6, 4 to 6, it says, Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. 
Now he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. Like that's a small thing. Yeah, you know, there were a few sick people he healed. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about the villages in a circuit teaching. Jesus, when he sees faith, he gets excited. He, he's now looking to go to work. If he sees no faith, he's limited in what he can do because we're not really his teammate, are we? We need more work, but thankfully we have a patient God. And then he charged them saying, take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned among themselves saying, it's because we brought no bread. I love the Bible because it tells, it tells you what people are really like. Do you know Mark is writing this down from Peter? Peter is the biggest bonehead in every story, and he's telling it like it is. You're getting to see all the dirty laundry out. You know why? Because it proves that the Bible's authentic. Because if it was a book written by man about man, it would say lots of great and wonderful high lofty things about man. That's what makes a bestseller. Unless it's just flat out honest, which the Bible is. So he says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and, and of Herod. Why is Jesus pulling that out of the sky? Because he just dealt with the Pharisees who had this view of power, had this view of what power looks like. Power looks like calling down fire from heaven. Fire looks like you snap your fingers and it happens, you know. Off with your head. You know, they had that idea of what power looks like. And that was not at all what Jesus' ministry was about. And Herod was exactly the same way. And we're going to see that later on as we get further in the story. Jesus warned the disciples against the contamination and view of power. And so it should be with us. I mean, most of us buy into the American dream. You know, I can, I can own my own property, my own house, picket fence, 2.3 children, a dog. You know, I'm going to have it all, and I'll have a, I'll have a helicopter one day. I've got to put a flat roof on. You know, like, we, we, it's always, you know, the, the guy with the most toys wins, and it's always, you know, I, I want to get the promotion, and I want my boss's job because my boss will get promoted. And, you know, uh, when does it stop? When do you ever have enough? And so he's telling them, be careful of the leaven, which is, you know, yeast, which I, I was thankfully reminded by Rocco is not a bacteria. It's a fungi. It's a fungus. But it's put in your bread and it makes it lovely and puffy and all those wonderful air bubbles inside there, especially for sourdough. So you, you pinch off a piece from an old one and you put it into a new one and it goes throughout the entire loaf. But sin is like that. A little bit of sin in our body leavens our entire lives and also everybody around us. So Jesus is always using leaven. It's this expositional constancy of leaven where leaven is always used as a contaminant. What they heard was, you guys are so stupid and irresponsible. I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to walk. <laughs> you see, they thought Jesus was condemning them for not bringing bread what he was doing is saying, be careful of your hearts that they don't get contaminated by this view of power that the people in power have, right? Worst thing I think you could do to a good man, put him in politics. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. All, right, all right, we got an amen from some people. Okay. <laughs> Worst thing, because you're going to compromise and you're going to bend and shift. All of your principles are completely fluid. We just, before I make up my mind, I'm going to have to take a poll see what everybody says. And then that's what I think. You have no spine. We understand that democracy is the worst form of government in the hands of evil people. Right. Thomas Jefferson said that, by the way. So if you, if you want to stone me and think I'm anti-patriotic, you can do that. But it's interesting. Sometimes when we say things, people hear something we didn't say. You guys find communication to be a difficult thing sometimes? My wife has a very comfortable place on the couch, but we have a couch that's really hard to get up from. Yes. And so, yeah, those of you who sat on know, it's deep and long and it's soft and it like swallows you whole. 
and getting up it requires a crane for some of us. <laughs> but my wife gets in her little spot, you know, she's got like a, a lounge area or she's, she's, she's got her pillow and her blanket and she's comfortable. But her drink is on the coffee table over there. <laughs> She's like, honey, could you get my drink? You think it's easier for me to get up off the couch? And you know, I, I like to think of myself as a servant because Jesus was a servant and he's my hero until somebody treats me like one. And then I find my heart I'm, I'm, I'm having the spiritual battle, you know, <laughs> you selfish man, serve your wife, you jerk, you know. So sometimes somebody will say something like, can you get my drink? And I, you know, I've got 50 answers to that. <laughs> of course I can. I'm as mobile as you. <laughs> because I'm full of sarcasm. The thing is, it's easier for me to do that because my feet aren't up and I'm not, you know, warm and you know so so it's a lean and a lean for me I can I can do this I still have muscle control but sometimes when I hear that I feel like you know she should be saying it with her glasses at half mast and oh please servant would you fetch my drink please <laughs> and so sometimes you'll say something you, you know, you'll pitch, you'll pitch something completely innocent, you know, like a, like a baseball, like over the plate, and what they'll catch is a watermelon to the face. <laughs> Jesus says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And what they heard was, you didn't bring enough bread, did you? <laughs> It's messed up, isn't it? If I was Jesus and they snapped like that, I'd be like, that's it, I'm out of here, I'm walking. I don't need to sit in this boat with you. But Jesus isn't me, and he's not you. Thank God. Now, there are nine questions that Jesus is prompted to ask the disciples at this point. But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, why do you reason because you have no bread? Do you not perceive or understand? Is your heart still hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? Do you not remember? When I broke out the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets of full fragments did you take up? And they said, 12. Also, when I broke for the seven, for the 4,000, how many large baskets of full fragments did you take up? And they said, seven. And he said to them, how is it that you do not understand? You and I sitting here are like boneheads. How come they don't get it? I don't know. Why don't you get it? Why do we fret? Why do we worry? Why do we freak out? And Jesus has to take them through this process. I see a couple things here. Number one, they reasoned. You know, sometimes we think too much about things. We reason it out in our minds, right? Yeah. And sometimes we think too much and we believe too little. Sometimes it's a substitute. And the scripture says, do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path, right? Amen. So sometimes it's less thinking and more believing. Jesus says, why do you reason with yourselves? Number two. Why is it you don't perceive or understand when experience is constipated and it does not pass to learning? <laughs> you know, when we go through something, but we don't learn what we're supposed to, that's a spiritual constipation. Forgive the bathroom humor. <laughs> and it never passes into wisdom, but it should, shouldn't it? And the things that we're through that God has designed and allowed to come into our lives are there to make us stronger, more like him. And what we do is we just get constipated about it and we don't know what to do with it. Like the disciples. This is a picture of you and me. 
I'm going to learn the secret to this thing one day. Is your heart still hardened? Sometimes our heart is unwilling to learn. And sometimes we set our eyes on things we shouldn't. And we set our hearts on things that we shouldn't. And it contaminates the way that we see. And so Jesus asking these nine questions are slight shades of variation in each one of them. And he's saying, are your hearts so hard that you can't believe? Is that the issue? You know, sometimes we won't let ourselves believe because, my goodness, I put my heart on the Lord once and he let me down or somebody I love died or some tragic thing happened. And because you didn't process it and you didn't understand it, what happens is your heart gets cold. You say, I'm not going to trust God anymore. That's it. I'm done. Any of you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Have to be careful that your heart doesn't get hard because you don't use it. And he says, you know, with eyes, you don't see and with ears. You don't hear. We're supposed to use our senses to observe what God is doing, what Jesus is doing in our lives. He expects us. You see, he has a high expectation of these guys. Hey, guys, look at all this stuff. Uh, you don't get it. You got eyes to see, right? You got ears to hear. Maybe, you know, do I need to, you know, do some work on you and pray over you or something? God expects us to do better with what we have. He expects us to be good stewards of the experiences we've been through and the things that God's brought us through. And we bring them to bear in our own lives. And then we have something to give away, don't we? We've got a testimony about God's goodness and his faithfulness. And he says, remember you know, it is the doom of man that they forget. Remember, log past victories for future faith. If God's done something in your life, tell somebody about it. Write it down. Amen. Go over it. One of the most exciting things in my life is for somebody to say, so how did you become a Christian? <gasps> it's like opening a Christmas gift that I get to, to give. It's wonderful. Because now I'm going to tell you about how Jesus came into my life and made a difference. How he took a wretch like me who was completely lost, didn't know where he was going, tried to find pleasure in all sorts of things in this world and found nothing. Until Jesus came in and now I need nothing. Amen. Remember, remember when God does these things and these past victories, you've got to log them, write them down, rehearse them, talk about them, tell them to people. Rehearse them. A detailed account. Because, you know, as we get older, we forget stuff. Trust me, young people. <laughs> you forget stuff. You'll see somebody you know and you go, hey, dude. <laughs> How are you, sister? Because you forget stuff. It falls off the back shelf. You keep putting new things in, stuff falls off the back Rehearse it. So if you had to pick, what, what would be your problem? You know, we all, we all have our own little malady. We have our own little struggle, each one of us. So what do you think you struggle with most? As you look at that list and think about all the questions that Jesus asked. And I love Jesus for asking questions. Because you'll get to find out what's in somebody's heart without assuming it. And people are like a deep well. It says a good man will draw them out. And Jesus often did it with questions. Not accusations, not word of judgment, just questions. Which brought conviction, I imagine. They were convicted before he ever opened his mouth. So, Hebrews 13.5, I want to remind you of a passage. The author of Hebrews says, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. God said he will never leave you or forsake you. If you know him and you're in a relationship and he's adopted you as his kid, he's not going to get out of the boat and walk away. And he's stuck with these 12 guys, even though one of them would betray him. Another would just flat out deny him three times. The rest of them would scatter. And Jesus invested in the lives of these men, and he didn't leave them. But he did ask them questions, like, what's your problem? When we identify that, then God can do a work in our heart. 
I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. So next week, we're going to talk about the true test of what it is to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And Jesus lays it out very plainly, very simply for us, and then he demonstrates it. So I hope you guys are uh, enjoying being back in the book of Mark. It's good to have you guys out here today.